for Achieving a Dream. I've been a data coach since the launching of Achieving a Dream, so the 10 years uh, that we've been going on. And I'm also, I also serve as Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs at Our Lady of the Lake in San Antonio, Texas. I'm going to ask my friends and colleagues to introduce themselves, and then we'll go forward with the session. Uh, good afternoon, Enrico Rincones, Associate Vice President of Institutional Research Planning, Effectiveness and Analytics in Broward College, also a data coach, a uh, former head of data coach uh, for Achieving the Dream, and thank you so much for coming today. Mark Figueroa, I'm the Associate Provost at Lewis and Clark College. I'm also a data coach with ATD, and I've uh, been a data coach since 2006, and I've worked with nine schools across three states. All right, good afternoon. My name is Mike Flotis. I'm a data coach with several colleges in Michigan and a few that are finishing up in Arkansas. And then I'm fortunate to work at Palo Alto College, which is one of the Alamo colleges. And I've uh, served as the president there for the last year and a half. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Villanueva. I'm the vice president of academic and student affairs at Brazosport College. And I'm also a data coach with Achieving the Dream. Good afternoon. I, I thought that with the wonderful weather, this would be a sparse session, but thank you all so much for being here. I am not a data coach, nor have I ever been a data coach. So when in the description, in the description where Ken puts all but one, I'm the but one. Um, William Serrat, and I have the pleasure of serving as president of El Paso Community College. Okay, so I'm gonna lay down the context, and then each of our panelists will offer their perspective in about eight minutes. I have my time slots. Um, and then we're gonna open it up for discussion, okay? So there's a couple of uh, angles that we're utilizing when we're thinking about this session. And the first angle has to do with the changes in uh, leadership in higher education, particularly as it relates with college presidents. So. Many of you have probably seen the data, but when you look at the age of college presidents, there's been a change over the last few decades. In 1986, there were about 16% of college presidents were over the age of 60. Uh, now in 2012, 60% of college presidents are over the age of 60. If we look at the relationship between the increase in students of color representation in higher education and the representation of presidents of color, um, you see a, a different story. You see significant increases in students of color from 20% to 34% between 1986 and 2012. When you look at college presidents, however, it's gone from 8% to 13%. So the representation of presidents of color has not reflected the increase in students of color. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're also gonna talk about achieving the dream and the evolution of achieving the dream and where we see it going into the future from our perspective. And we're all, I guess what you could call generation Xers, okay? When we look at achieving a dream, it's evolved over the years. Not a whole lot, but it has evolved. And there are two primary um, uh, principles and steps that you often hear about. You hear about the five principles for achieving a dream, committed leadership, use of evidence, broad engagement, engagement, systemic improvement, and equity. And you also hear about the five steps of achieving a dream. So as we're approaching this work, we think about initially beginning with a commitment to improve, to increase student success, the use of data to prioritize any potential actions or programs, engaging stakeholders broadly to develop a plan, implementing and evaluating that plan, and hopefully establishing a culture of continuous quality improvement. And we've been very fortunate over the last 10 years, eight years, to see this from the inside out. And so we bring that perspective to this, um, to this presentation. We've also identified some challenges and lessons learned along the way, and we're gonna talk about those. So I'm just gonna mention some of those, and then uh, each of our panelists will go into a deeper discussion of each, okay? First thing we've learned is 
borrowing a best practice is not necessarily good practice. And so when we first started achieving a dream, you know, just in all, in the sake of transparency, this was called the Strategy Institute. It wasn't called the Dream Institute. So colleges would look at their data, and this was all necessary. They need to look at their data and their outcomes and figure out where they needed to intervene. Oftentimes, when they realized there was a certain student population that was, uh, was not as successful as others, we would, colleges would come to the Strategy Institute, look at various existing strategies, and sometimes borrow those. Right? What we needed to do, we needed to ask why, and we needed to dig deeper. Okay? So um, we know now that borrowing a best practice ignores the local context that's Im important for colleges. It actually impedes continuous quality improvement because you haven't built that infrastructure to really ask the tough questions. And it really is, is in many ways, it goes against critical thinking because you're just borrowing someone else's idea and implementing it at your college. Okay, um, another one. Taking interventions to scale, that's been a big challenge uh, for any initiative, is having enough students exposed to the intended change to have an effect overall. Okay, interventions that impact classroom and learning. Another big challenge, a lot of the changes that have taken place have, have, have been interventions that work with students outside of the classroom. So we want to talk about that. And then superficial data collection and use. So superficial, meaning concerned with only what is obvious or apparent. And that's another lesson learned that we can't just say with the initial data collection that we've gathered, we gathered that, that's, that we know we need to intervene here. What we need to do is ask deeper and deeper questions. And the superficial data collection, action based on superficial data collection, has impeded our impact, we, we would argue. And then finally, uh, another big challenge is the ur urgency for quick results, right? Initially, when we started, we had five years to work with colleges. We don't have five years to work with colleges. There's, there's not the patience to wait five years to see if your college had an impact or not. We want to know right now. We want to know soon, okay? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first uh, speaker, and she's going to delve into these issues much deeper. So I guess this is kind of a ladies first thing and then they want to get me out of the way. Um, as, as Kenny... <laughs> has to go first. <laughs> as, as, as Kenny said, a lot of these conversations did really arise um, talking late at night um, and that's because achieving the dream not only stands for achieving the dream but also achieving the drinks. And so <laughs> we had a lot of fun conversations. Um, you guys really are uh, go-getters to be out here uh, this late. We really didn't expect such a large crowd. So I, I wanted to take kind of a, a, a general overview about this topic and um, really, first of all, thank my colleagues who are up here who are all really very gifted individuals. The title of our session, as you heard, is Generation X Leadership in the Next Decade of Achieving the Dream. Um, when I thought about this topic, I started to think about the many, many articles that have been published about the differences between baby boomers, between Generation Xers and millennials, and how these differences will shape the future of our work. While I recognize that there are differences, I have to tell you that I'm a psychologist and I've always been trained to understand that while there are differences between groups, there's a lot more differences within <laughs> groups. So instead, I'd like to focus just a few minutes on a comparison um, where we are as community college leaders and how we've been focused in the past and what I liken to as idealism and where I urgently believe community colleges must now focus what I'm calling reality. So to begin, I'd like to discuss the idealism of equality versus the reality of equity. So we've all heard the line, the United States, the land of opportunity for all. This mantra is synonymous with the notion of equality. And in our world, every man and woman should have an equal right to education, right? Well, community colleges were developed as an answer to this mantra, delivering education and training to the masses. This was a great thing, but now we're faced with the reality that there are huge achievement gaps between various groups. Compared to Caucasians, let's be honest, Hispanics and African Americans are far less likely to earn a degree or certificate. These disparate outcomes are also seen for first-generation college students and students of low-income backgrounds. 
And as much as we'd like to believe that every person has the same opportunity to succeed, the reality is that that slope of opportunity is far steeper for minority students and students in poverty. So this reality has led us to understand that we are not all created equal and that we come into our institutions with different needs. Whether the issues are language barriers, cultural differences, or socioeconomic challenges, we must be advocates for students with these diverse needs. And it is our, in our inherent duty to change how our systems deliver instruction to a multicultural society and to take a stand against any perceived injustices on behalf of our students. And our passion about this really shouldn't be so surprising to those of you in the audience, because you see, for the very first time, we here in front of you come from the very same background of the students that we actually serve today. So for myself, as a first generation student from divorced parents, I truly understand many of the challenges our students see because I've lived them. And while I must support faculty, staff, and my colleagues, I believe that my strongest responsibility is in being the voice of the student. So this means that I must listen to the needs of our students and provide them with services that meet their needs. Second is the focus on the idealism of access versus the reality of completion. The traditional model for measuring success and providing funding to colleges has relied primarily on enrollment, thus ensuring a focus on accessibility. However, as we now know, our nation has been in rapid decline with fewer U.S. citizens who have been able to achieve an associate's degree, and we are now 16th in educational attainment across the world. This traditional model of funding based upon a, an enrollment doesn't align with our national student success agenda for completion. So we're seeing a large shift in incentives away from costs of educational inputs towards stronger performance outputs. And in, again, my opinion, this shouldn't be so shocking. Is it acceptable to ask for increased funding if we've increased enrollments when just a fraction of those students who we've led into our doors have completed their goals? I'm not sure all of our stakeholders would agree that we should be, we're making a great return on their investment. So the public demands accountability, and I believe that we should demand it of ourselves. This means that as we move into the future, we must be prepared to answer questions such as, are our, our programs effective? How do we know? What is the return on investment if we fund a program? And if we can't answer these questions, we surely can't expect that completion rates will change or improve. The third area I'd like to focus on is the, is the tradition versus, on the, the focus on tradition versus the need for innovation. We're acutely aware that we're living in a global economy. We provide a general education core curriculum so that we can prepare our students to be global citizens. But this hits a little closer to home for me. In the community college outside that I serve in, outside of Houston, we're experiencing a great economic boon. Recently, over $20 billion in expansions have been announced, calling for thousands of employees to serve in, in process operations and in construction crafts. And one estimate is that we'll need approximately 450 new process operators every year for the next several years to meet the demand. And our traditional classroom model isn't too bad compared to others. 47% um, of those who enter this program are going to complete that degree within three years. But in actuality, that program is producing less than 100 students for, uh, every year, far less than the anticipated need. So traditional classroom models are still needed because we do have some traditional students. But the majority of our students are non-traditional students who work for a living and have, a real, and have real life responsibilities. So the time for innovation is long overdue. For these students, we must instead design accelerated programs, create stackable credentials, and ensure that the programs complete, that students complete lead to gainful employment. The times of saying, we just don't do things that way here, may lead to our demise. And if we don't build these types of programs, industry and students will simply go elsewhere. Finally, I'd like to discuss the focus on stability versus the need to take reasoned risks. Change can be uncomfortable, and many colleges still want leaders who will not destabilize their institutions or rock the boat. While we certainly can't afford leaders who are fiscally irresponsible or, un or unethical, our situations demand that we take informed and reasoned risks. Now, I love, to, I love to speak about the successes of my own college, but as a leader, I spend much more time discussing the ways in which we're not achieving the results that we need to significantly improve student outcomes. So when only 5% of our students who start off in the lowest level of developmental mathematics will ever complete a college level math class within five years with a C or better, I have to ask myself and my staff, is it okay that 95% of our students who intended to complete a college degree 
are never going to attain one. Folks, there's never been a more critical time to rock the boat. This means that we must prioritize our efforts to achieve much higher levels of student att attainment and success, even if it upsets some of our colleagues and our stakeholders. So in closing, Achieving the Dream has created a wonderful opportunity and a platform for all of us who are sitting here and in the room. We're in the spotlight. The development of a student success agenda has been securely etched in our minds, but this focus on student success must be more than simple, empty rhetoric. We must be zealots in our pursuit of student success. This means we must come out of the closets and expose our failures. We must continue to identify achievement gaps and be willing to get at root issues that are preventing large groups of students from completing their goals. And when we know the answers, we must be willing to design innovative programs that meet the needs of students. And finally, we must not only embrace change, but it's time for us to lead that change. I look forward to leading that change with all of you here. Thank you. Dr. Serata from El Paso Community College. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Certainly, um, as we got ladies first and out of the way, uh, no pressure, <laughs> no pressure for me. Uh, a couple of things with regards, you know, I I'm very fortunate to have worked at two round one Achieving the Dream Institution, South Texas and now at El Paso Community College, both VMI Austin Award winners. And so really part of what we did is we really focused on building that culture of evidence. And what I'm here today in this morning's uh, uh, plenary kind of stole a little bit of thunder. So we'll, we'll touch on that again. We have a, a variety of our folks here in the audience today. Certainly thank them. Um, two things about this particular picture. Um, this is more and more the face of higher education. She's a young Latina that we have at our institution, amazing student. But this is more and more the face of higher education in the state of Texas, and it's starting to become the face of higher education demographically throughout the United States. Now, there's a couple of issues, and for a primer for a session tomorrow, we really need to focus on men of color. And so the men of color that are in this room, I thank you for what you do, and no pressure, but you're a huge role model to young men of color in your particular communities. And we need more of you in this room and in our classrooms. So part of the Achieving the Dream initiative was building a culture of evidence based on data, and really it was the analysis of the data, and now we've come to find that there's a face behind every single one of those data points. We have to understand that, we have to always make sure that that's what we move forward. We've been very committed at El Paso Community College in building that culture of evidence based on the use of data. These are just some of the examples of what we've used. We were early adopters of SAS, we've used that SAS to then turn around and develop several metrics that help us judge how we're doing. Now, I have a real issue with the data. I, I, I'm a data geek. I'm not a data coach, but I am a data geek. And so I've always been someone who's crunched the data, who's looked at the data on a regular basis. And I can't thank the staff and our administrators and all of the folks, the technical expertise that went in to develop each and every one of these particular metrics. They've done a great job. Here's, a way, here's how the dashboards that we've developed at the institution work, how they go through our data warehousing, and how they come up from there to do a variety of great particular pieces. But I have an issue with the data. This is all dead data. It already happened. So I can look at the data and I can develop trends and I can develop initiatives and we as a team can develop initiatives to try to address the data, but those students that the data failed or that we failed, they're gone. And so what's the next step? You heard some of it as I said this morning with regards to predictive analytics. I really believe that that's the achieving the dream 2.0 when it comes to dealing with the data and remembering that there's a face behind that data. So once I have all this data, I can try to change it for the next cohort that comes through, for the next semester, for the next year, the graduation data for the next three years. But what about the students that we're losing in that pipeline? And I know that Dr. Rincones is gonna speak to some of this as well, so it'll be a nice segue as we go forward. But really what I'm focused on, you know, all the different data in there, I'm gonna continue, and it's important that we continue to look at this, because all of you who have worked in Achieving the Dream know what. When you look at this data and you focus on the data, what happens? The data tends to improve. Not for that particular cohort any longer, not for that particular student, but as a whole for the institution. Because it's human nature. When we're focusing on my process, well, we're gonna work harder to try and improve that process. And when everyone's focusing on that, then it, it tends to improve. 
It may not be by any specific strategy that we implement it, but the fact that all of us are looking at that, it tends to improve. And so this is no plug and no, no one asked, you know, Mark and his group didn't ask me to do this and Charles was here doing a pre-conference as well. Um, but this is one of many vendors that is out there now that's looking at, really looking at advanced analytics. What do we know about the student before they're our student? What do we know about our students as they've applied to be our students and what initiatives, what, how are we using that data not to deny admission, it's part of the reason I work at a community college, very proud to be an open admissions institution with high expectations for our students. And so what can we learn about our students before they step in day one? The preliminary data is very encouraging. The preliminary data says that before day one, they can know up to 73% the success rate of that student based on information you're already collecting. By the end of day one, it jumps sometimes up to over 80%. So that becomes the next piece. And the other part of it is, not only is this live data, we've got to get the data into the hands of our students. You know, I was very privileged to be a part of the White House Summit, and the First Lady got up there and said that we can't just talk about education and our children. We have to talk with our children or young adults about their education. They're a full partner in this education, and what we'll find is they are connoisseurs of the data. And we've got to get the data in their hands. If we know that it's a toxic course schedule of courses that they've chosen to take, and we need to let them know that. They need to know that. And see, here's some of the examples on the advice. You see the degree map for advisors and students. So they themselves can say, well, if I'm in this degree, how much longer do I have? How much more do I have to pay for this degree? And if I switch majors, how much more will that add? And how much more money will I have to pay for this degree? Or guess what? You actually could switch and shorten your time to degree if you look at it and do the what-if scenarios. But getting the data into their hands, it's their data. They're the student, they own it. And as far as we implemented a, a new scheduling software link for our students. We did absolutely no marketing on it, much to my dismay. In the first month that it was out there, 13,000 unique students hit it and used it without a single penny towards marketing. Our students are dying for this. You see them every day in class, pull this out, or on your institutions, and they're asking for apps. And I know that several of us have worked very hard and our folks in technology have tried to develop those apps and they've done a great job. But now we have tools that have been developed by private monies that we can utilize to get those apps into our students' hands. Again, dashboards that they can use and see where am I in this process? What about the badges that I can actually earn along the way? Where do I go from here and get it? Not only us utilizing the data, but if we know this is bad for students, why aren't we sharing that with them? Or if we know that it's something useful, why aren't we sharing it with them? So I firmly believe that the culture of evidence and using data at our institutions will remain. I believe the young man last night who talked about acceptance, empowerment, and advocacy. My fear is that our state legislators are pushing us to no longer be open admissions institutions. I fear very much that. And I want to ensure that we do that. But empowerment, this is empowerment. Getting the, their data into their hands so that they know how to use that data productively. And finally, as far as advocacy, each of you in this room are advocates to be able to put forth the policies and procedures that you know that will facilitate student success for those students. It may be in purchasing a tool. We're going to have to work smarter in addition to working harder. And what tools can we utilize to do that? Thank you. Dr. Figueroa from Lewis and Clark. I'm there. Can I get a clicker? Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit different slant, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, our leadership, leadership and Generation X and what that means. Uh, before I get started, I want to acknowledge and thank those who've come before us. Um, the courage and strength that they displayed under very different conditions to do the work that they did to allow us to learn from them, to learn from their successes as well as their failures, and to take what we've learned from them and translate that to our students. I think right now, though, we're at a time 
where we need to take those lessons for ourselves as leaders and figure out where we need to go moving forward. So that being said, as a, as a Gen Xer, I guess that's what we are. I'm also admittedly and proudly to say I'm a hip hop kid. I grew up with hip hop. It wasn't here. I grew up with it. I remember the first time I heard Busy Being Treacherous 3, uh, Grandmaster uh, Flash and the Furious 5. I said, man, this is something different. I really love this. And so I tried to think about sort of the first 10 years of my life from undergraduate until I became a grown up, um, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to do for a job. And wanted to put sort of that framework um, around, around this, uh, this presentation. So for those of us who are hip hop kids, we understand and we know that the lyrics and the artists have a very deep, uh, provide very deep meaning for a lot of us. And there's certain lines that you hear in a song. You know where you were, when you heard it, and you never forget it, and that context matters. So how did I get into this work? Um, I had a student interview me about three years ago for part of his graduate class asking me about my career path and how I got here. And I guess he thought I had a very sort of uh, uh, linear progression. If I did A, B, C, and D, I'd become E. And it really forced me to reflect and think about you know, my schooling, my training, professional development, and all that sort of thing. And I wanted to give him as truthful and honest an answer as I could. Um, so that really forced me to think, how did I get here? Um, I come from a law enforcement background. My whole family, my, the men on both sides of my mom's family, my dad's family, are both on the input side and the output side of corrections. Um, so, I saw, so I saw and lived firsthand what institutionalization really meant. And what bothered me is that the faces didn't match. The first time I was taken uh, to a juvenile detention center, my dad had those, that sort of old school mentality where, oh, you think you're bad, let's go and let me show you. And, he, and I, all I saw was faces of kids who were just a little bit older than me living like animals. And I said, this does not look right. This does not sit well with me. And so I said, man, why does this happen? What's going on? And I was, I think, right around my freshman, sophomore year in college, um, some guy by the name of Ice Cube had his first solo album. This line stuck with me because I remember my first day in college. The tour did not look like my first day in college. I remember the tour. I think I met every student of color that was on the campus and every faculty member, all one, two, three, four of them of color that were on the campus. When I got there, it didn't look like that to me. And this question stuck in my head and I would walk around campus thinking, why is that? It's another hip hop reference for hip hop heads. You know who said that? Um, so this is the question that started, started pushing me towards my, you know, sort of uh, what I was gonna do in my education. So I started to take classes, did research, thought a lot about answers to this question and really got tired of people always wanting to know from me, how is it that you made it? Any of you ever been asked that question? How, raise your hand, please be honest. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. And most of the answers I heard they gave from my experience were BS. So what I learned, what I learned is that we'd become complacent. We blamed a new generation for not making it, for not holding up their end of the bargain. Though I asked myself, were the expectations of that agreement ever, ever translated to us? This was another point in time where I realized people expect us not to succeed. They expect us to fail, and we come up for reasons why. If any of you have ever heard this song, this is probably one of my top three or four hip-hop songs of all time. It's called Mathematics by Most Def. And I think this carries a lot of weight for a lot of people. He can't spell, but that's okay, because he'll get you on PlayStation. And we've allowed that to become a norm and, an, and, a, and a reason for why our students are not succeeding. So this complacency, I think, helps us or forces us to fall into this trap of settling. You know, given the enormity of our challenge and the daunting tasks that we face in higher education, we tend to look at short gains and highlights because it makes us feel good and it allows us to show people, hey, we actually know what we're doing. And I need to apologize, as a football coach, I tend to use football examples, and I think this one fits here. Um, too often, I think we are fascinated and hang our hat on what we call the deep pass of the long ball. People love to see a receiver flying down the field, ball goes in the air, outruns a defender, makes a spectacular catch, and scores a touchdown. As a coach, that is not the way you run a football game. As a commissioner of NFL, that's the way you sell tickets, but that's not what coaches like to do. So it's very difficult for us to take that methodical approach of marching down the field two or three yards at a time, gaining first downs towards the end zone. And I think part of the problem is that people expect us to be able to show and highlight that sort of extremism, and we're, in, we're enticed by that extremism. But we don't need to have a TD every single play. We just need to be patient, monitoring and tracking our progress, constantly assessing and making adjustments. If they can do it on an NFL field, play to play, there's no reason why we can't do that in higher ed. 
We need to flip the script and we need to help our students. We need to, we need to, as an institution to not look at our students and ask what's wrong with them, but we need to figure out what's wrong with us. What do we need to do to better serve them? This is our cultural shift, moving from expectation, from exception to expectation. But we need to be able to communicate what that means, what do we expect in multiple modes, <coughs> forms, and to multiple audiences. Back to Ice Cube. <laughs> if there has ever been a poster child for adaptation, we went from America's most wanted to father of the year. Just because things were one way doesn't mean they, often, they have to stay that way. So in order for this change to occur, we must do three things. We have to listen, we need to hear, and we need to act. What happens if we don't? Well, we lose out on what our students and our community still have to teach us. We need to set our ego aside, get back to the basics. Who are we? What are we about? Who do we ser serve? And are we doing the best job we can? You want to know how you're doing? Ask your students. And be ready to listen, hear, and act. So one of the things I hear is that access is no longer a problem. Uh, I really think that's a problem because it still is an issue at the student level, but also at the faculty and staff issue. Any of you content with the number of faculty and staff of color you have on your campus, please raise your hand proudly. I'll wait. Two out of three, four, two, three. I'm gonna guess that's probably less than 10% of the colleges represented in the room. So we still have an issue, both at the access, but also on the retention side for faculty, staff, and students. So what do we do as leaders? What should we expect from ourselves, our colleagues, and our community? What should we expect from, what should they expect from us? One of the questions that we've struggled, and I brought this up with my colleagues yesterday, is there a difference between a, being a Latino administrator and being an administrator who's Latino? It's a personal challenge that we need to take up, but it also comes with responsibility because we do have consequences for not moving. We have to make moves or others are gonna make them for us. And back to most deaf. I appreciate this quote because I think this highlights the way we, our mode of action and our mode of thinking. We can't wait for permission anymore. We have external threats and pressures. Oh, which one am I? Okay, so I already said that. So there. Um, so we need to be able to figure out how we're gonna go step up and make moves before others make, move for, make moves for us. I remember when I was in graduate school, there was a question about what ladder you're gonna climb and how you're gonna get there. My question is, who's holding my ladder? And has anybody showed me how to climb the ladder? Yeah, I watched you climb it, but that doesn't mean I know how to climb it. Did you teach me where to step, how to step, to never step on the top step unless you have a safety net? Those are the sorts of things we need to think about in terms of supporting ourselves as leaders as well as our students. Speaking of ladders, I think we're still enamored with this aura of hierarchy, and we still have a goal to make sure our students get into the best schools. Did any of you not, were any of you not told that you should get into the best college you can? It is always about that. Can I get into the best college? Parents spend hundreds of millions of dollars, kids sweat, they're on uh, you know, prescriptive medications because they're so amped up and anxious about where they're gonna go to school, as if the be all or end all of your life is the college that you choose. I'm ready to tell you folks, I've been at those those destination institutions, the aspirant schools that people want to be to want to be at and send their kids to, they're not all that. They have the same problems that we all do, sometimes even more, and it's laughable. When I go back to my home institution, I hear what we complain about, it makes me laugh. Um, so getting better students, that's not always the answer, nor is it our option. We get who we get, and what I like the most is that we get these kind of kids. We get kids that are rough, rugged, and raw. And we get faculty and staff that are the same way. But I also think that we, we, need can, we can work with that, obviously, because there's a lot of energy, a lot of passion, a lot of desire. And we need to move towards the new three R's, which uh, are rigor, relevance, and relationships. With respect to the rigor, we need to make sure that our game is tight and exemplary. And with respect to relevance, is what we're doing and offering what our community needs? And how do we communicate that? Lastly, with respect to relationships, which are we developing, which are we neglecting, and which do we need to tend to? Because we're still all in this together. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so um, I love thinking about the future and uh, when I saw this picture, I just said, I love it. I have an 11 years old and uh, anyway, that's not her by the way, but <laughs> I, just, I just love the whole concept about thinking about the future, the next generation about uh, uh, achieving the dream. And when we think about the future, we kind of look like uh, these 
uh, image that we see here. We, we try to look at the end, but it's blurry all the way around, and, and we just can't. We, we, we just try to imagine, but we, ju we just can't. So, uh, the present. I believe that before we can talk about the future, we have to uh, talk about what we know about the present, what we know in the present, all right? So, uh, we all know that we live in a digital era, correct? It's just, it's just, it's just crazy, the amount of information and all the uh, uh, analytics that we have and the emails and the texting and the Twitter, um, et cetera. <laughs> and, you know, when, when we talk about big data, I just did a quick Google search uh, with big data and I got 1.6 billion results in 0.29 seconds when it comes about big data. Don't get me wrong. Um, I believe that many of these companies, uh, uh, you know, we, we may have here some of them, you know, Civitas and Sogotech, they have amazing products. But it is not about whether you have the big data or the small data, is what do you do with it? Can you use it? Do you have the right culture within your institution to support the decision making behind the usage of that data? So you can have the best car parked in your garage, a Ferrari that goes 300 miles per hour, however, is manual, so it has a stick, right? And the, 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 the wheel um, is on the right-hand side, uh, the steering wheel. The steering wheel is on the right-hand side. So how useful is for that? Are you ready? Do you have the highway to support that kind of car? <laughs> so it comes kind of of the data. The data is not everything. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, during the break, I was uh, overseas, and I was looking at all these headlines uh, for platforms that will disrupt higher education, uh, you know, the mocks will replace the classroom. We, we, we get bombarded by all this kind of information, right? We, we get these emails daily, and it's just crazy. So my point, uh, point I'm trying to make is that we have to be selective. We have to increase our data um, literacy. We have to empower our users. In Broward College, uh, where I work, I introduced the Data Ambassadors Initiative. We are empowering faculty and frontline staff <coughs> to use student data. We are doing some uh, uh, custom-made training. We team up with the Association for Institutional Research, and uh, they did an amazing job. They have the Data and Decisions Academy, and uh, all of our data ambassadors are taking uh, that course. So, uh, you know, we, we are facing what I call the Takaoi effect. The Takaoi effect, that's not Japanese, by the way. That's the amazingly crazy amount of information that we received. <laughs> the Takaoi effect, we made that up. <laughs> but it's not true. We have to become better consumers of data. We have to be selective about what data we look. If we have key indicators, just stick with them. Follow your, uh, your data and you, you have to start saying no. You have to put priorities. You have to say, wait a second, why are we looking into this? We already have something in place. Don't, don't, don't change route if you already have a horizon and a point B where you want to get. So be more selective, all right? Achieving the dream have offered us an amazing framework for us to look at key indicators of success. It's also provided us one of the best learning experiences, namely right here, dream. I love coming to dream. And you know, it also support us with documentation and a national network with institutional change, public policy, et cetera. We also find other kinds of informations out there, like for example, Complete College America. Have you read these reports? If not, I will ask you to please take a look at it. It provides amazing, not only point of data, which are really surprising, but it gives you some uh, identified best practices in particular colleges for you to look at. So, um, I think we need to work on our uh, data literacy and be more selective. We also have to look at different kind of data and data differently, two different things, all right? So I don't have to introduce this, this gentleman right there. He was this, the keynote of uh, the annual convening which happens last September in, um, in Seattle. I have been working with the Gates Foundation for over a year now on a segmentation study in which we are looking at the non-cognitive, non-observable trait of students, particularly mindset, which are the mindset, thank you, the mindsets that um, you know, with which they come to the classroom and they stay in classroom and they, you know, uh, they, they uh, are uh, more successful or not. So, on the top, we have one mindset, which is the ROI skeptic. These are the kind of mindset that inhibit success. And the students who are um, skeptic, 
you know, about the return on investment. They just say, it's, it's not for me. I don't think a value of getting a degree when I go to the college. The second one lacks of belonging. Yesterday, you, you, you heard um, Angel, for me is Angel. That's his, his name, Angel. Anyway, um, uh, talking about the lack of sex of belonging, uh, a sense of belonging, excuse me. You know, uh, some students, they, see, they don't see themselves belonging there. So on the other extreme, however, we have this mindset, and these are the, enab the enablers, the one that enables success. And uh, when I went to college, I, I, that's the mindset that I have. Why I am fortunate enough to be a, a second generation uh, college student. So my dad was, you have uh, uh, two options. Option A, you go to college. Option B refers to option A. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Um, uh, this is just one example about the different offerings for the ROI skeptic, okay? So uh, this is still in, in the works with the Gate Foundation, and uh, we are still working on how we can take this to the classroom and uh, identify the different mindsets of students. And uh, again, it's still in the works. Just stay tuned for more. Check out their website. Uh, there is more information. If we really want to see change, we must be willing to do things differently. You all know the definition about insanity, right? Trying to you know, get different results by doing the same, sad, same thing. So anyway, we, we just need to embrace change. And this is my last point. We have to be ready for an alternative. And in this case, I just, uh, I just you know, came up with uh, ATD 2.0. I just said, well, we have the, tra the traditional track in which originally, you know, 10 years ago, there were five-year commitments. And then uh, several years later, they changed it to three years. And um, the commonality is that the first year, planning year, uh, the second year and on is um, uh, the implementation year. So what I am proposing for the first time is a compressed version. We are going to take year one and two and just have it in year one planning and implementation to get, you know, one after the other, but within one year. The focus though is going to be on execution, okay? And it's going to be focused on leading measures not lagging measures. A lag measure is, for example, success rate of students getting a C or better. Why is lagging? Because we have to wait one term to see the result. Leading measures, however, are those that we have to monitor daily or weekly or monthly. Yesterday, Angel Angel said <laughs> that they dealt with the issues on a daily basis. Do you remember that? It was you know, suffering day by day and week by week. Um, anyway, this is my last slide, and pretty much what I'm trying to say here is that uh, in ATD.0, what I see is that uh, any of the schools can apply, but the focus is not on interventions. The focus is on a goal, a particular goal. And then you have to identify leading indicators that are going to help you reach that goal. And there will be several uh, uh, initiatives that can work towards you getting to that goal, okay? And it will be the uh, interaction, the dynamics among those initiatives that will help you. There is more information. If you want to uh, learn more about this <laughs> idea of mine, just uh, talk to me later. Thank you so much. <laughs> In what other presentation do you hear about MOSDEF, Ice Cube, and Takawi? <laughs> yeah, so, and, and the tweeter. So I'm going to, um, <laughs> so as, as you can see, and, and Ken opened up with it uh, at, at the start, essentially um, many of us have worked together as colleagues as part of Achieving the Dream along with other data coaches and leadership coaches and fortunate to work with wonderful college teams and so we have a good time and so we wanted in a sense to be able to tell, um, to talk to you and to seek as Mark said some feedback and input and we're gonna have Q&A right after this um, but what does the experience look like for us to get a sense of what your experience looks like and then what can we do and 2.0 has been kind of thrown out there related to that and what I want to give you is just a kind of a local context related, related to where we're at so one thing, how many of you, so I'm gonna go from Moss Depp and Ice Cube to Jane Addams. How many of you know who Jane Addams is? And Jane Addams related to Whole House. So, okay, there we go. So in a sense, my, my thought really, and what I talk about is, is that I think many of us really are, and I'm not, my background's not in social work, but I think that many of us, community colleges really are the modern day settlement house 
for our population, especially when we live in a bifurcated economy with a widening gap between rich and poor. And so what I want to talk to you about are three C's, both the campus, how we create community and engage our community, and then a modern day currency for the students that we serve, which are credentials and certification. For them, that is of the utmost importance because that provides the trajectory for them to gain a stakehold in the American middle class, a piece of the pie that is forever shrinking in our current economy. So this is our campus. So the photo on the left, it looks relatively picturesque. You know, we're semi-urban. We're right on the edge of the city of San Antonio. Palo Alto has 8,500 students. We're part of the Alamo Colleges system in San Antonio, which is a five college system of 65,000 credit students, and then another 30 that come in for workforce. Okay, so if you look at it, Whole House in a sense started as a night school for adults. Really it was almost a precursor to continuing education, had a library, a gymnasium, child care center, all of these things that community colleges today provide. And our facilities in a sense, if you looking at this on the 26 years that we've been in our physical plant, have an array of services, just like Jane Addams did, and just like she provided to, at that time, which were ethnic e Eastern Europeans in the city of Chicago. In our sense, what we're providing is access to a predominantly Hispanic population that varies year to year from 69 to 71%, which is relatively high outside of South Texas. That's one of the highest proportionally within Texas or the, oh, I'm sorry, William. Yes, yeah, so or El Paso, right? So, but in looking at that, we look at our, our school district data, and they are 88 plus percent Hispanic. So is there a disparity there that exists? And looking at that in particular. So one of the things, this is kind of Bear County, and this is why this is important, because you may have in looking at your data kind of blinding flashes of the obvious. So in looking at this, we're right here. This is Bear County, which is our taxing district. How many of you have been to the Riverwalk? It's like right here in downtown San Antonio. So our reach pretty much is in this kind of vicinity. So we looked at the scatter plot and said, wow, we even reach into affluent areas of San Antonio and Bear County. And we have some distinct occupational technical programs, but they're relatively small, kind of on the upswing. And in looking at this, our sense was, well, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, we have, we're having people come in from affluent kind of suburban subdivisions, all of these things. And in teasing out the data a little more, what we discovered is about a fifth to a quarter of our students come in, in a sense, to take internet courses with us. So they're not students that arrive on that picturesque campus. They're not students who are looking for that full-time experience. In fact, only 20% of our students are full-time. Five years ago, that was 40%. So dramatic shifts in our student population and their course taking patterns. So then in looking and teasing out that data, what are some of the things that we can do and what are some of the things that we can talk about together as stakeholders? And so in looking at that, and many of you have attended all of these sessions, right? What have we done? Where do we need to go? How can we tease out what my colleagues talked about, those leading and lagging indicators related to the data? How many of you look at the daily enrollment reports and then hope by the time school starts and you can send the state your reporting information that you'll hit your enrollment target? Okay, maybe, okay, I'm just the only one then. But uh, raise your hands, everybody does. So those are, in a sense, the four disciplines of execution tells you that those are really your lagging indicators. We're just hoping and hoping that we meet our enrollment target, but we don't look at the other indicators as far as how many students walked in that day? How many students talked to an advisor? How many students have paid their bills? All of those things, so how do we tease that out? So what we're trying to do is to utilize a framework that Achieving the Dream has provided, other initiatives as part of that to say, how can we ensure in a sense that these students here, that we kind of have more dots within our general vicinity, that these other students, although they may come to us for convenience, it's an amorphous block and we don't have a sense of how we can engage them in particular. So I talked about the campus, but what can we do in a sense to create community? So we know that students come to us from throughout our region for unique programs. So if we're looking at expanding and emerging industries in our area, 
We're part of the Eagle Ford Shell kind of region, natural gas, fracking, all of those things. So we created an oil and gas program because we know we need to expand what we can do. And looking at it, remember that 88 plus percent of Hispanic students that are in our neighboring ISDs, yet we're only about 69 percent Hispanic. How can we close that gap? Well, we have wonderful relationships with our high schools. We know that our students in particular, through dual credit, first generation potential college students, particularly for us because we offer it for free, and we know that once they take those courses, they average about three classes with us. They're more likely, one, to graduate from high school, two, more likely to enroll with us. And so what can we do to kind of expand that particular um, presence? And then all of you know what high impact practices are, right? So how can we, and William talks about this quite a bit, these are the PCP students. These are the parking lot, classroom parking lot students, right? Gardeners. So, yes, yes. Gar yes, so, so, so how, can we, how can we, in a sense, formulate and create community with our folks? How can we facilitate that? And I know all of us are kind of looking for what will work. So I went to a wonderful session today and I thought this will be fantastic. Let me just get the model and we'll take it back to campus. But we know that local circumstance trumps everything. Organizational culture and local circumstance. So although somebody may have had a wonderful model today at a session, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be conducive to our environment. So in looking at discussions, and, the, and most of these actually emanated from a college-wide conversation of over 300 folks um, at Palo Alto. High impact practices, learning communities, new student orientation and convocation, which community colleges I think really came late to the game. That was really maybe the first day of class for most of our students <coughs> looking at their maps and their class schedules. And so we offer a concentrated five, six hour new student orientation. They come in, they get engaged as all part of that process. And then peer advisors, from the sessions that you've attended from Angel's comments last night, from other things in a sense what they're saying is, we want to feel connected. We want to be part of the community and the currency that we utilize in a sense are really other students because they have street credibility and that's what I think Ice Cube would tell you, right, Mark? Yep. So community related to that then, we know students are successful. They're really, really successful when they have the power of place as the Gates Foundation talks about. So imagine if they began their college career while they're still in high school. We know from our data, and Palo Alto has no early colleges, but we will have four on our campus starting in the fall, this fall in August. So we'll gradually go up, and we've looked at best practices, and then we've looked at two early colleges in our particular in San Antonio. So out of our 8,500 students, everything constant, 1,800 of those will be early college students. Starting in the fall, 450, and then quadrupling all the way up to 1,800. So what impact does that have on the students? But then I think all of us need to be mindful as we look at interventions, then what impact does that have on our current environment? And how do we, how do we um, what recourse do we utilize? So related to that. So the other thing are the modern day currency, which are credentials and certificates. So in looking at that, I mentioned oil and gas early on. A lot of our folks, we know that life kind of gets in the way, so they come for one particular thing. Some of them come and say, I have a semester, I have two semesters, and then I'm out. I want to go back, I need to support my family, so how can I be able to do that and what are you going to provide to me? So in looking at this, this was our oil and gas certificate. A student can come in in the first semester and be able to achieve 18 hours and then go back into the field and gain an average wage of $21 to $23 per hour, and that's with that level one certificate. Stackable certificates, they can come back and take their 12 hours and then they can go back and take one of two tracks for production and processing technology. You've heard about the success stories. Many of you are probably already doing this. This is something that we built on from your experience and the experience of others within our system and what Achieving the Dream has within the kind of promising practices database. And so we know that this is a modern day currency for our current settlers, right? These are folks that are looking to be successful and be part of the American middle class. How, and it's incumbent upon all of us, working in community colleges, can we provide that, one? Two, how can we utilize the network that we have as part of achieving the dream to do that? And how can we talk as colleagues 
and engage both faculty and staff that aren't in this picturesque setting that are back on campus to be part of that and to gain and leverage that for a greater good. Looking back at campus, how do we do that face-to-face -face or online? How do we create community for any of those folks, regardless of the medium? And then how can we ensure that we have a modern day currency that's credible? Because a lot of our students are looking for that certification or that credential so they too can be part of the middle class just like the rest of us. All right, we're gonna open it up for question and answers, uh, discussion, hopefully a rich discussion about uh, the tensions of the future of higher education, the challenges for community colleges in the context of changing leadership and the challenges we talked about earlier. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just mention is you know, all the folks here have been at this heavily for 15, 18 years and thinking about this almost you know, geeks about how to increase student success, particularly for Latinos and students of color. Um, and so I, I think it's a, a rich opportunity to have a discussion about how we move forward as a community. So questions, discussion. I just wanted to add uh, thank you for all of all of you and what you talked about today. And I know that many people in this room hope to become leaders at some level. And there's a whole body of literature that's been developed over the last hundred years on leadership. And if I'm not mistaken, a couple of these guys came out of the only community college leader, true leader. 
All right, so uh, at Broward College, which is uh, down the road south of here, two and a half hours uh, uh, north of Miami, that's where I work. We have been uh, working with the four discipline of execution, that's, that's the book from which we borrow the methodology, and uh, we have been working with uh, leading and lagging indicators for over one year. And we are seeing, uh, we are seeing unbelievable results, uh, three quickly. We have increased our FTIC enrollment, uh, double digits, two terms in a row, and we have increased our retention rate of STIC students from 80 to 84 percent. Now we are focusing on specific areas like, you know, developmental mass and all of that. Now, you have to have a cultural change and it has to come from the top. But don't get me wrong about from the top. If your president does not support or is not into moving that, you know, the direction of the organization, institution, excuse me, uh, you know, to make that shift, that uh, cultural change, it, it simply won't happen. And he, you know, the first thing that he, he did was, after he read the book, he bought the book to the, the senior uh, administrators, and, and all of us read the book, and then he said, Rigo, why don't you put together a retreat so we can start looking at lagging indicators? And we did that, that was step number one. And together, you have to work collaboratively uh, uh, college-wide, but you go by campus, for example, and you start asking them to help you identify leading indicators. And in our case, we have weekly phone calls on every uh, Monday morning at 8.30, we get on the phone, the president, the provost, the campus president, and uh, we talk about what we have done the uh, week prior and what we are going to do this week that is going to affect the goal, because again, that's what I am suggesting, that we need to focus on goals rather than intervention. If you want to learn more, I have a session tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. with my Broward team, and we are going to be talking about specifically these leading lagging indicators, the four disciplines of execution, etc. cetera. Okay. Yes. Rico, what was the name of the book again? The four, four disciplines of execution. Four DS, the four disciplines of execution. Other questions? Yeah. What, let, me, let me throw out something, because we actually wanted to be a bit provocative. And one of the things that we haven't talked about explicitly I is... is <laughs> no, we're just getting started. <laughs> and, and, no, no, I, so let's, get, let's, let's talk about income, okay? And, and the role of income nationally looking at the entire national higher education context, okay? When you look at the entire national higher education context, there are some institutions that are feeling pretty good right now. When you think about community college, who's feeling good? The national higher education context, I'm talking about four-year highly selective institutions. Think about wh where they're at, the national context. Their enrollments are higher than they've ever been before. Their endowments are higher than they've ever been before. They're going up now, even as the economy bounces back. Their corporate partnerships are skyrocketing, and they have more test prep babies than they ever had before. And if you think about test prep baby, babies, what I'm talking about is kids who've been groomed to score really high on the SAT and ACT test, and that's the best predictor for that is income. Okay, so those institutions, life is good. And then when you look at everybody else, and I'm talking not only community colleges, but public non-selective institutions, you see a huge gap in outcomes. I'll give you an example in Texas. At Texas, University of Texas at Austin, Texas A&M have 80% six-year graduation rates. All the other publics, about 40%, 30%. Big, huge gaps. And then community colleges, you know, we're, we're struggling too. So what's happening and what's the role of income as we think about the work that we need to do? And so I'm actually putting that on the panel. Well, one of the other things, you're looking at the income, the role of income with regards to institutions. And, and one of the things that, that we hear a lot, and I've had the good fortune, and in particular here, we've done, we've, we've used the case method, big fan of the case method, copy and steal everything, make it your own, make it work for your institution. And yet, when we think we're there, then look at transfer, which we all know is a huge part of the work that we do. 
And one of the pieces that I keep, one of the articles that I keep is an article entitled The Reproduction of Privilege. And it shows a 40 year gap, a 40 year timeline of baccalaureate attainment level by income level. And so in 1970, the top quartile attained baccalaureates 40.2% of the population by the age of 24. By 2009, that had risen to 82.4%. And then the bottom quartile, which is our students, that's who we serve. The bottom quartile went from 6.2% to 8.3% in 40 years. So every time we think we're there, that's who we serve. Those are our kids that are trying, to, those are our students that are trying to transfer from our institution over to the university and get a baccalaureate. We play a huge role. 70% of all new students in Texas start at the community college. 80% of all minority students start at the community college. And they have, many of them, their goal is to attain a baccalaureate degree. We have a responsibility to help them get to that baccalaureate degree. So, there's a huge disparity in those bottom two quartiles. The third income quartile is not very much better. From 16%, pardon me, from 10% to 16%. We have a long way to go with regards to income. Let's get back to the question that you actually uh, threw out, uh, Mark, and that was the difference between a president who is Latino, who happens to be Latino, and Latino president. Can you speak on that a little bit? Sure, I think the, this question came up, um, like I said, a while back at a conference, and I was challenged by a senior uh, president who was my senior um, because I asked him that question. And the response was something to the effect of, well, if I made it, then everybody else can make it. And it was this very sort of traditional bootstrap mentality that there is a way to be successful and if you follow this path and you abide by the rules, you'll be successful and you should be thankful for the position that you got. And I said, but what's your responsibility to the community that helps support you and bring you up? He didn't necessarily think that that was his responsibility. And I said, I don't think we cannot have the responsibility. So whether, I mean, you can fill in anything, any group that you want beforehand, you have a representation. You're on a college campus, a student looks at you and sees you, most of the time they don't really care what you do, you're just one of them, you're one of the, them, the teachers, the administration, you're somebody there that they're gonna go to. Whether you like it or not, I think there's inherent responsibility uh, to pay it forward. And I think if we're not including that as part of our leadership program and our training for leaders, and I think we're, we're shortchanging students because None of us did this on their own. I know when I came up, I had a, a, a mentor, and I asked him, I said, why do you spend so much time, and why do you care about me? He said, you'll understand when you get older, and all I want you to do is pay it forward. And I do that in every chance I get. And I have colleagues who don't think it's their responsibility, but I think it absolutely is part of your responsibility whether you like it or not. Students are looking to you, and if you become that one person that they're looking to, and you turn the cold shoulder, you've lost them. And it's really hard to regain that trust. And guess what? That student saw you on campus and went to you and you did not give him or her the time of day, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna turn around and tell their friends, don't go talk to that person, they're a fill in the blank. So I think, I think it's an inherent responsibility. We, we, can't, we, don't, we can't detract from that and we can't say no, I don't have time for that today. So that's, that's my take on it anyway. Questions, other questions to prompt discussion? Heard the comment. So, in the spirit of uh, the next decade of achieving the dream, you know, for the, over the last ten years, achieving the dream has, has been has been pushing us to to look at the data, to desegregate the data, and we've been doing that. I mean, at my own my, at my own institution at Austin Community College, we um, we have been at that work for, for quite some time. And we um, have learned that we are really lagging behind with regards to the participation of our Hispanics and, and African American students. And so for, for me, now it becomes a question of we have the data, we know what the issues are, and how do we change the system to make the change that needs to happen? And I think that we're really not talking about that. And the conversations of all this data and all the, the really tragic data points that we know about, 
we're really not focusing on changing our internal system. Um, I have a social work background, right? <laughs> and so I understand uh, Jane Adams, and I understand very well the population who's coming to community colleges. And I also I have a very um, a systems perspective, and I, that's how I view the world. And I think that we're not really focused on, on that. And so I'm interested in knowing from the panelists what is it that you are doing at your institution to change the system, to change and to, and to, and to have an impact? Uh, if I can just take this one and I'll pass it off. Um, one of the things that I would say is we haven't dug deep enough into the data. And I think that's when Dr. Sadata was talking about getting data in the hands of students, is they're gonna start seeing this data, they're gonna ask questions, and deeper questions, and deeper questions. And oftentimes when I'm looking at the work that that I, in my own institution, institutions I've worked with as a data coach, we get the first layer of data, we're like, oh, I know what we need to do. And we haven't asked the next deeper level, and the deep, we have to keep going deeper. And I'll give you a concrete example. I, I do lots of focus group training all over the country, and what, what do I often hear when I do focus groups with students, is they'll say, you know, what are their biggest challenges? And they'll say, you know, getting, balancing the workload is really tough talk to faculty, students aren't turning in their assignments. And I'd ask, ask faculty more about, well, well, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. And I said, well, you wanna see my grade book? And a faculty member showed me their grade book. And they had their grade book has all of the assignments that a student has to do, particularly for new students in the first year. And they'll say, look it, 40% of my students didn't turn in their assignments, that's why they got an F. And so, and students are tied, can't keep, with, can't keep up with all these assignments. We never asked the question before, I never asked the question before, how heavy is their academic <coughs> workload? And, uh, and so we actually asked the question, we pulled the syllabi for students who were taking 13 units, uh, a first year student. And we, we categorized the quizzes, the readings, the exams, and we did it by week and month. This is what it is for a freshman, first year student, in the month of September, they had 86 assignments that they had to track and complete, <coughs> 13 units, right? Because we pulled all the syllabi and we put this together. Then we said, okay, I'm actually at a, at a university, but we have s mostly Latino students, first gen, uh, and most of our students are not test prep babies. And so we said, well, what about students who've gone further, who have passed their first year? And this is what a junior has, 24 assignments. And it was like that every month. It was for the freshmen, it was for the first year students, it was like 78, 82, 84. And for juniors, it was 17, 18, 24. And, uh, and that opened up a lot of additional questions for us. So long story short, what we did is, you know, there's something fundamentally different about how we're treating our new students. How faculty think about a new student versus someone who's in their second or third year. And we treat them differently. And we need to think about what that means. And so, this is going deeper for us. Yeah, true. And the literature Well, I mean, I would question whether whatever literature they're reading, they're, they're reviewing and saying is sacred. We often do that. We say the literature is this, so then we do X, Y, Z because of this, this broad statement. But I'll tell you, just looking at this, just looking at our local data, you have 84 assignments for a brand new student who went to high, just came from a high school where they did all of their homework in class. They didn't have textbooks that they were allowed to take home and all of a sudden we're giving them 84 assignments. And so, and so then we compare that to other students. And you think about who's best prepared to handle 84 assignments? Uh, someone who's in their second or third year or someone who is in their first year. And so it's totally flipped. And we've been honing in on those assignments and we're, we're, we're seeing some significant results. But we need to have a conversation about why so many assignments. 
And why so many assignments? Well, again, when I do focus groups with faculty, it's like, well, we have to break it down for these students. And we can't just give them three papers. We have to give them a little thing here, a little thing here, a little thing here, a little thing, all throughout the semester. And all the other classes, they're doing the same thing. And next thing you know, there's 84 assignments. Anyways, I want to get my panel any time to respond. Going back to the data that you, from Austin, that you had looked at, we participated in an institute and we had, it was related to minority males and looking at their enrollment patterns before success. And what we discovered in looking at that in particular is that our most significant and successful group were Hispanic females. And so actually that they outperformed any other group. One, as freshmen, they were more likely um, to be full-time students than any other group. They were also more likely to persist within the term, within the fall, to go from term to term, fall to spring, and then from academic year to academic year. But then when we compared with all other groups, Anglo males and females, um, they actually had a lower GPA, but they were there. So they started, they studied, they took more courses, um, and they came back time and time again, but they had just a slightly a GPA that was a little lower. But that was something that we had not kind of teased out to that degree, and it came as a result of participation looking at another group. But once you disaggregate the data by subpopulation, gender, or ethnicity, then you're going to have some findings. So our kind of point right now, our juncture is, okay, so then what, what do we look at and what do we do? And we have to, we've been in achieving the dream for close to 10 years. So as part of this, it's ever evolving and ever changing. And so you just have to recalibrate and look at that. And then I think each institution has different data to look at, in particular as far as, and then being targeted, realizing that we have finite resources. And I think it was instructive with the Georgia State gentleman this morning, um, because he's talking about the value of analytics. But remember, uh, Sandy Schubert asked him and said, you're talking about that the unit of measurement is the student. So we have to think about you know, what comfort level we have with that. Because in a sense, with the analytics and maybe not the, the product that they're using, but they're able to tell you then the previous history by looking at transcript evaluation, how successful previous students have been in those particular courses. And so in a sense, we've never really delved into that paradigm. You know, so we also have to think, and that gives me a little bit of pause, but it's something that we need to move forward um, towards perhaps, but how do we do that deliberately with the sense, once again, of we have to meet students where they're at and the support that we need to provide for them. So, so I think it's important, and it raises lots of questions for all of us, and this is a challenging time for us to be involved in higher education with that sense of accountability. Can I, so can I follow up real quick? Um, I think the other, the following on that point that Mike made, I think one of the other challenges we have is we do a very poor job of socializing our students. Think about the way we receive our students. I think we're very presumptive and I think sometimes we need to get out of our current sort of mindset or the mindset that some of us hold as the most recent student you were. So if the last time you were in school was as a doctoral student and that's your point of reference, that's an inappropriate point of reference. <laughs> Um, I think we need to teach a lot of the students. I'm looking at what the data can present. 84 assignments. I'm betting you those students didn't do 84 assignments their entire senior year. But yet we have them come here with this expectation that this is a workload you should have. Any of you ever stop working out for a long time and then start working out again and you try to go full bore that first day? That's what we make students do. You have been on the couch for 10 years. Get up and you're going to sprint. You pull all kinds of muscles. You're sore. You're not working right. You're in the doctor's office and you know, Tylenol or Vicodin is your best friend. We don't want that to be the case for students, but yet that's what we do. And I think we need to socialize based on where they're coming from and translate, because I think that's we do a poor job of that. And I, a lot of the students, a lot of the young men I work with are very entrepreneurial spirits and had a very good entrepreneurial life prior to some other institutions that they attended before they got to us. What I've told them, I said, I and we need to teach you how to translate your hustle, because everybody has a hustle. It's how do you translate that hustle into our world of higher education that's a different culture with a different language, a different set of expectations, and a different set of outcomes in a way that you conduct yourself. And I think that's what we need to work on. And I think that's a piece that we miss up front.
important. I, I think getting back to the classroom, and that was one of the challenges, one of the lessons learned, that for us to really be successful in this national effort, increasing student success, we can't just focus on a student success course or things that happen outside of the math class, the English class, the philosophy class, et cetera. And so for faculty, when we pulled this data, the question that came to my mind was, this goes to your point, Trudy, I thought, are we, are our classes assignment driven or learning outcome driven? Mm -hmm. And I have had faculty members, I've had conversations with them where I had a, fac a student uh, get kicked out of a program because they got below a C. It was a, it was a certain kind of program. And um, it was in one course. And she said, uh, and I remember this, she said, well, she got a B, and she was talking about it, her colleague's class. She, she got a B in my class, but the only reason she got a B is because she turned in all her assignments. She really didn't do well on the final. She really didn't do well on the paper. And I was, I was like, whoa. And so, but, and when I have conversations with faculty, they'll show me elaborate um, grade books with the assignments, points for each assignment. And then I've had conversations where they'll say, 30% of my students are gonna fail this class before the semester begins. Because that's what they, they can predict based on previous semesters. And they're saying the reason they fail is they don't turn their assignments. So the assignments just kept coming back, kept coming back, kept coming back. And so we need to have serious conversations about learning and, and how we're teaching to facilitate learning as opposed to, I think right now, particularly the way we treat community college students and students in non-selective institutions is we need to, you know, we don't know if they're really ready. So we, 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 we treat them, I think, fundamentally different than we treat other students, first, first year students. And we need to talk about that. I think it's a great question. And I think that what you're looking at, you're looking at really from federal policy from the federal government with regards to Title IV Pell. And Title IV Pell, as each of you all know, full load is 12 hours. And so we've seen, I mean, we're seeing the gamut on the university saying, no, we need students to take 15 plus hours. And we know that there's the law, full time, the data is very clear that if a student's full time, their likelihood for success, success actually rises. But you get to the point of diminishing returns. It's not wise for them to take 15, 16, 17 hours. You know, usually the, the data will show that 13 to 14 hours is actually the good load. The issue with that becomes what is the mix of courses that they're taking? And that's the goal of looking at with, with tools like Sevitas and other predictive analytic tools is saying this is based on prior data. Students that took this course load, that's a toxic mix. Don't take this course load. Yes, you need to be full time. But try to take these courses. You know, it just like if I try to take four math classes in a semester. You know, it, I, I, now I took four English classes, it worked for me. But it wouldn't work for all of our students. So it has to be the right mix of courses of what they're taking. Because the federal government's not gonna pull back. In fact, what they're looking at now is what kinds of strings do we attach to the $150 billion of aid that we give out every year that we really don't have any strings attached to. So when we see states looking at performance-based funding, Performance-based Pell's coming. It's just a matter of time before it gets to us. And so the, the key would be this. The key happened two, it happened for two years and now it's gone. Extended or second Pell was the key of having, and we all saw community colleges across the nation, the two summers that we had extended Pell. And again, the data is very clear that if students take courses in the summer, their likelihood for success in graduation goes up dramatically. Even if they're not your home student, they're at the university, away from where, whichever university they come home for the summer. If they take a class for you, their likelihood to complete at their home institution rises dramatically. 
But we don't have, and then, you know, our data, 87% of our students are on some type of financial aid. 90% of that is on federal Pell. So if we're not, if we don't provide them with the Pell during the summer, they're not going to come. That was the key of being able to take a lower course load and being successful because you had the opportunity for the extended or second Pell cycle. It lasted for two years. The, the, the Ryan budget has not gone into effect, but so many parts of the Ryan budget have, and that was one, eliminating Pell, summer Pell, right? opportunity. One more question if there's any any other questions. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming.